Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured. But the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. In the course of his essay towards a rational theory of tradition, Karl Popper is going to discuss how it is that science, in the sense that we think of it today, managed to arise and become something that is not reducible to, but certainly involved with traditions. And he wants to make a case to his fellow rationalists that, you know, we don't want to simply reject tradition as if it's anti-science. We need to see that science itself is connected with, as he's going to call it later, a second order tradition. So he begins by saying that um, the peculiar thing which we call scientific tradition has often been discussed. People have wondered about how this thing that happens somehow in Greece in the 5th and 6th centuries before Christ, how did this arise, the invention of a rational philosophy? What did actually happen? Why did it happen and how? So these are really three important questions to ask and to provide answers to. And so theories of what science is, or you could call them philosophies or histories of science, are going to be answering these questions. And Popper actually wants to criticize, as part of science, some of what he considers to be inadequate, essentially ideological, ways of explaining the rise of science. So oftentimes people will say, okay, so Greek philosophers were the first to try to understand nature, but when we say understanding nature, we mean understanding what happens in nature. And so, you know, we get these early physicists like Thales and his student and, you know, their students explaining things in terms of water or air, you know, basic materials. Then we get sort of metaphysical principles coming in with, you know, Parmenides and Heraclitus and the atomists and all of that. So this is not good science of today, right? Even Aristotle's stuff for the most part, you know, we're like, yeah, we don't buy into those sorts of theories anymore, but it's taking a stab at things. It's trying to understand and then to explain to others what's going on in this vast world that includes us and everything that we can encounter and observe. And Popper says, well, yes, that is part of what's going on, but that's an unsatisfactory account. Why? He says, the early Greek philosophers did indeed try to understand what happened in nature, but they were Johnny-come-latelys, so to speak. There were other people who were trying to understand what was happening in nature before them. Who are these? The myth makers, the mythologists, the people who had all sorts of accounts for what was going on, you know? The ocean is rising up because of an earthquake. Well, that's Poseidon. Poseidon must be mad about something. That is an explanation. And to come up with, you know, a scientific explanation later on, they're all in the same realm, right? So he says, um, when they were saying these sorts of things, that was the type of explanation which was found satisfactory before the rationalist tradition introduced new standards of explanation. So what was the decisive difference? It wasn't that you're actually paying attention to things and those myth makers were just, you know, making stuff up. He actually says, you know, he doesn't invoke Occam's razor as such, but he says, 
If you're looking for simpler explanations, it's a hell of a lot easier and simpler to explain uh, Zeus being angry than to understand a scientific account of a thunderstorm. And to say that Poseidon is angry is a simpler and more easily understandable explanation of the high waves of the sea than one in terms of friction between air and the surface of the water. So it's not just providing explanations. It's not just thinking about things. What is it? What differentiates science? So he uses a key term here, discussing. And it's going to be coming up over and over again in here. And discussing doesn't just mean sitting around the campfire, BSing with each other, speculating about stuff. It means engaging the other person in discussion, in what we could call dialogue, in what we could call dialectic, whatever term you want for something that involves putting something forward and then maybe asking questions or raising counter ideas or possible counter examples. In other words, adopting a critical attitude or developing a critical attitude. So he says that instead of accepting the religious tradition uncritically and as unalterable, instead of merely handing on a tradition, they challenged it and sometimes even invented a new myth in place of the old one. We have, I think, to admit that the new stories which they put in the place of the old were fundamentally myths, just as the old stories were. But there's two important things about them to be noticed. So the first thing that he's going to talk about is that they were not just repetitions or rearrangements, they contained new elements. And he says, now nah, that's not a big thing by itself. But the second and main thing is the Greek philosophers developed a new tradition. So they didn't leave tradition behind. They invented a new counter tradition, which actually we're going to talk about as a second order tradition in just a moment. So what does this new tradition look like? The tradition of adopting a critical attitude towards the myths, the tradition of discussing them, the tradition of not only telling a myth, but also being challenged by the man to whom it is told, right? Telling their myth, they were ready in their turn to listen to what the listener thought about it, admitting thereby the possibility he might perhaps have a better explanation than they. Now, Popper is going to assert this was a thing that had not happened before. Okay, that may be a little bit too restrictive. Perhaps that did develop before in other places, other literature, but it really does take off, at least in the West, in the Greek-speaking world, right? He says a new way of asking questions arose together with the explanation, the myth, the question would arise, can you give me a better account? So this is something that Popper takes as being absolutely central to science. And another philosopher might answer, yes, I can, here it is. Or he might say, I don't know whether I can give you a better, but I can give you a different, which does just as well. These two accounts cannot both be true, so there must be something here. We can't simply accept these two nor have we have any reason to accept just one of them. We want to know more about the matter. We have to discuss it further. We have to see whether our explanations really do account for the things which we already know and perhaps something we have so far overlooked. So this is a new tradition. Popper's going to go on and he's going to say something really interesting here. My thesis is that what we call science is differentiated from the older myths not by being something distinct from a myth, that's the wrong way to go, but by being accompanied by a second order tradition, that of critically discussing the myth. Before there was only first order tradition, now there's a story to be handed on, but something new, a silent accompanying text of a second order character in quotes, I hand it on to you, but tell me what you think of it. Think it over. Perhaps you can give me a different story. And he goes on and says, the second order tradition was the critical or argumentative attitude. And he says, this is, I believe, a new thing, and it is still the fundamentally important thing about 
scientific tradition. So science isn't radically distinct from myth. It, it's not radically distinct from tradition. As a matter of fact, you can't really even have good science without tradition of some sorts. It's different in that it involves this critical, not just a critical attitude of I am the critic and I look at everything that you say, critical discussion back and forth, perhaps even a community. So this is a really important set of points that he's going to make. He's also going to talk about systematic observation. Now, this is something that a lot of people, when they're teaching about science, think back to like, you know, middle school and high school and textbooks about the scientific method, right? There actually isn't a scientific method that all scientists in all sciences buy into, but we present it that way. And a lot of people, including scientists, often are deluded by this into thinking that science is primarily about systematic observation of the phenomenal world. And then after that, we come up with you know, hypotheses, we test them, we get theories, and th they go into the textbook. You know, and we just accumulate a lot of ideas. So Popper's gonna say, in the critical discussions which now arose, uh, there also arose for the first time something like systematic, and he puts that in italics, observation. Because it's not like people weren't observing things but systematically observing things, why? So they can take these accounts that have been developed and say, do they actually seem to line up with what it is that we observe? And he says, it is the myth or the theory which leads to and guides our, our systematic observations. Observations undertaken with the intention of probing into the truth of the theory or the myth. So we don't just start with observations first and then you know, form theories and, or you know, hypotheses uh, as a halfway point there. No, we have to have theories already. Then we can begin to systematically observe. And he says this has been the case since ancient Greece. So he's going to talk about the searchlight theory of science, and he's going to contrast that against the sense observation theory. So what is the searchlight theory of science? He says that, here we go, um, the view that science itself throws new light on things, it not only solves problems, but in doing so it creates many more, and that it not only profits from observations, but leads to new ones. If in this way we look out for new observations with the intention of probing into the truths of our myth, we shouldn't be astonished if we find that myths change their character and they become what one might call more realistic or they agree better with observ observable facts. In other words, under the pressure of criticism, myths are forced to adapt themselves to the task of getting, giving us an adequate and more detailed picture of the world in which we live. Right? So this is why scientific myths, which he's perfectly willing to call them, become different than religious myths. But he says, we should be quite clear, in their origin they remain myths or inventions, just like the others, not what some rationalists, the adherents of this rival theory, the sense observation theory, believe. They are not digests, that is accumulations, of observations. And he says, let me repeat this. Because this is an important point. Scientific theories are not just the results of observation, which is not to say they don't involve observation. Of course they involve observation because that's how you, you test things, right? And you know, go through this iterative process of refining your scientific myths. But they're not just results of observation. They're also the results of what else? Myth-making and tests. Tests go by observation, so that's very important. But observation's function is not producing theories. It plays its role in rejecting, eliminating, and criticizing theories. It challenges us to produce new myths, but we have to have myths. And those myths need to be you know, involved with the critical attitude or the second order tradition that we're talking about here. So you're never going to get completely away from myth in doing science. And he says, you know, if we want to think about how a young scientist 
ought to proceed, should we just give them the advice, get out there, you know, don't have any preconceptions, just observe things, look around the world, take notes. And Popper says, no, no, that's not a good idea at all. He's badly advised if his teacher tells him, go around and observe. He's better advised if his teacher tells him, try to learn what people are discussing nowadays in science. Find out where the difficulties arise and take an interest in disagreements. Those are the questions you should take up. In other words, you should study the problem situation of the day rather than just going around and making a bunch of observations, right? So why is this the case? Well, because, you know, we don't actually start completely new. We inherit and we work within scientific traditions, which can undergo considerable revolutions as well. So this leads him to talking about how do we actually explain science? And he brings up two other theories here, accumulation theory or criticism. And he says that it's necessary for us to see that of the two main ways in which we may explain the growth of science, one is rather unimportant and the other is important. The first explains science as uh, an accumulation of knowledge. It's like a growing library or a museum as more and more books accumulate, so more and more knowledge accumulates. And this is a very common way in which people think about not just science, but the accumulation of knowledge in the present, right? Oh, we got all these reports and studies and books and websites. Uh, we're doing great. Well, no. There's several problems with that, but Popper points out a big one. He says... Another way to explain it is by criticism. Science grows by a more revolutionary method, a method which destroys, changes, and alters the whole thing, including its most important instrument, the language in which our myths and theories are formulated. And he says, there's much less accumulation of knowledge in science than there is revolutionary changing of scientific theories. And he says, this is a strange and interesting point. You might believe that for the accumulative growth of knowledge, tradition would be very important. And for the revolutionary kind of tr development, tradition would be less important. But it's exactly the other way around. Why? Because if science could grow by mere accumulation, it wouldn't matter if the scientific tradition were lost. You just start again. You just accumulate stuff, you know, beginning from scratch. But... Popper says, no, um, that's not the way it works. If you have nothing to alter and change, you, have, you can never get anywhere. You need two beginnings for science, new myths and a new tradition of changing them critically. Such beginnings are very rarely made, he says. And so what we actually need is strong, robust traditions of science, which include criticism as an integral part of that very process of science, which is going to mean that maybe science, the sciences, could look very different from the sciences of today 200 years from now. It's not just going to be, well, we figured it out, now we just get the data and you know, do some studies and put it all together. No, that's not the way that Popper conceives of science. And he thinks that, you know, we can trace this all the way back to these ancient Greek philosophers and their very beginnings in this interesting tradition, a second order tradition, that we now label as science.